Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Good afternoon and welcome to Pacific Partnerships in Education. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here on Think Tech Hawaii. With me today in the Think Tech studio is Paul Haddock, co-host and uh, CEO of Prell. And we've got a special treat for you today. Some of you may know the work of Kathy Kitchener, uh, Marshallese poet. She uh, wowed the UN uh, a few years ago and got a standing ovation there. She has done a new poem uh, on site. Uh, and we're just going to jump right into that video and show it, show it to you. Um. I'm coming to meet you. I'm coming to see you. What stories will I find? Will I find an island or a tomb? To get to this tomb, take a canoe. Take a canoe through miles of scattered sun. Swallow endless swirling sea. Gulp down radioactive lagoon. Do not bring flowers or speeches. There will be no white stones to scatter along this grave. There will be no songs to sing. How shall we remember you? You were a whole island once. You were breadfruit trees, heavy with green globes of fruit, whispering promises of massive canoes. Crabs dusted with white sand scuttled through pandanus roots. Beneath looming coconut trees, beds of watermelon slept still, swollen with juice. And you were protected by powerful Eroj, chiefs birthed from women who could swim pregnant for miles beneath a full moon. Then you became testing ground. Nine nuclear weapons consumed you, one by one by one, engulfed in an inferno of blazing heat. You became crater, an empty belly. Plutonium ground into a concrete slurry, filled your hollow caverns. You became tomb. You became concrete shell. You became solidified history, immovable, unforgettable. You were a whole island once. Who remembers you beyond your death? Who would have us forget that you were once green globes of fruits, pandanus roots, and whispers of canoes? Who knows the stories of the life you led before? Here is a story of a turbo goddess. She gifted one of her sons, Leda, a piece of her shell anointed with power a leathery green fragment, hollow as a piece of bark. It gave Leodao the power to transform into anything, into houses and trees, the shapes of other men, even kindling for the first fire. He almost burned us alive. I am looking for more stories. I look and I look. There must be more to this than incinerated trees, a cracked dome, a rising sea, a leaking nuclear waste with no fence. There must be more to this than a concrete shell that houses death. Here's the story of another shell, anointed with power. Leodao used it to transform into kindling for the first fire. He gave this fire to a small boy. The boy almost burned his entire village to the ground. Licks of fire leapt from skin and bones from strands of coconut leaves. While the boy cried, Lidl laughed and laughed. This is a story of a people on fire. We pretend it is not burning all of us. Here is the story of the ways we've been tricked, the lies we've been fed. It's not poisonous anymore. Your illnesses are normal. You're fine. You're fine. My belly is a crater empty of stories and answers. 
only questions. Hard as concrete. Who gave them this power? Who anointed them with the power to burn? That's a pretty powerful statement. Uh, that's an incredible video they, they did. Um, <clears throat> maybe, Paul, you can tell us a little bit about how Prell got involved in this, in this project. One of the things Prell wants to start doing is being a voice for issues in the region that most people don't know of. Mm -hmm. I and mean, how many people have heard of the Runet Dome? Mm -hmm. We do know that there was some nuclear testing in the Marshalls, but what most people don't know is there were over 67 nuclear tests done in the Marshalls. 80% of all the nuclear power of those explosions that the U.S. has ever tested took place in the, U in, in the Marshalls. So the big tests were done there. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't know this history. and They don't know there's this huge dome on on a small island, which is currently starting to leak radio radiation out into the surrounding lagoon. And with the help of, of Kathy, who's well known as a poetess and a voice from the region, the beautiful cinematography of Dan Lin, and especially the support of people like Pam O'Midier, we're able to now start getting stories like, out, like that out to a greater audience. Absolutely. This, this need, needs to be known. I mean, clearly this is a, it's a, it's a major issue that we essentially dislocated a bunch of people off their traditional homelands and then ruined the homelands for all time, basically. Yeah, and we wanted, we wanted to spread it here, too. We know that over the last couple of years, as more people from the Marshalls and the FSM moved to Hawaii, there's been a bit of a tension. We think maybe this may evoke some more sympathy from the locals here when they understand these are people who've lost their land and were told that they were helping protect the world during these experiments and these tests. And we should be maybe a little bit more welcoming as they come here because they have no place else to go. Right, right. I mean, the, the whole land area, the Marshall Islands, is really minuscule. It's a relatively small number of square miles because it's just little thin sort of sandbars, as it were. Uh, and now parts of it have been ruin for all time, basically, that, that, that people still cannot live uh, in certain parts of that, certainly. Yeah, they'll never be able right. to go home, right. and even the people living in Enoetok, they can't sell their fish, right. they can't sell their handicrafts. The idea that they're very close to this active area of, of radioactive toxic poison makes it difficult to have any sort of viable economy. Right, right. They, they're, they're not going to get any tourism there. Yeah, no. um, as you say, the, 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 because, the, because that dome is leaking, the lagoon there is actually contaminated, and yeah, it's, you, you really don't want to be eating plutonium, huh? That's, no, that, that's no. a very bad idea. No. <coughs> and I've had people ask, why can't they just move to another island? And that's the difference between maybe Western or, or mainland American thinking. Mm -hmm where we can move to Oklahoma or Montana, there's plenty of open land. On small islands, all the land belongs to a clan or belongs to a family. You just can't up and move onto someone else's land, and those islands are very small. So they have no place else to go. So they've gone to places like Ebi, where there's 12,000 people living on 0.29 square miles of land. 
And so they're looking for new places and they're coming here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I mean, people, we think sometimes of Oahu as a small island, but Oahu is gigantic really compared to any of the islands, the Marshall Islands. Virtually none of those have anything more than maybe, what, 250 yards wide at they're, any they're, point. If you ever get to Majuro, sometimes right. the island is the street. Right. You can look out your right-hand window, your left-hand window, there's the lagoon, there's the ocean. Right. I think the highest point of land is six feet above right. sea level, and that's a, a man-made bridge. Right. Except for now, Mount Majuro, their their dump oh, okay. actually has about All right. four stories worth of stuff piled up. And again, that's that's another issue on small islands, yes. right? What do, they, what do they do with the waste? And we saw in, in that video what they they had to do because that that dome was actually made in the 1970s, right? Before that, the island was essentially littered with. There was radioactive material spread out all over the place, and they just went and kind of shoveled into the hole, turned it into a concrete slurry, and covered it up. And the U.S. soldiers that went in there have faced all sorts of issues with cancers as they've grown older. Right. Yeah. So I was just talking with a, a doctor recently on who had been in a radiation conference, and he says, yeah, well, more than 20 percent of them have have various health ailments that are pretty pretty clearly triggered by that. And that was they were only exposed for a relatively brief time and many years after the event. Uh, it's, it's, it's sort of appalling because they at one point actually allowed people to return to, at least to, to Bikini, right? Just a few years after many of these tests were done, people went back and they were told everything was cleaned up. It didn't take long for them to realize that that was a mistake. Mm -hmm. The islanders completely trusted what they were being told. Mm -hmm. And so they were told, please leave so we can do, conduct these tests. It's going to benefit the world. Mm -hmm. They had no idea why they were leaving. Uh, and as you know, there were some islanders who were fairly close to some of the larger tests, like mm -hmm. Castle Bravo, who were impacted by the fallout. Oh, yeah. it's, it's a sad chapter in our history, uh, one that's very difficult to get past. But I believe we need a lot more sympathy for the people of the Marshalls and for Inouetok and Bikini, who are still dealing with this 60-something years later, as we hear even even now, words like nuclear bombs and nuclear were kind of being bandied about exactly. the ways they, they should never be used again. Exactly. This is, this is very, a very good reminder that this stuff, you, you don't really want to unleash this kind of force in the world. Uh, it, it, it really not only can kill off people, but just destroys the land in, in, in an ugly, ugly way. Uh, the uh, islands were effectively, uh, those islands were effectively sterilized. I mean, they've had to replant the trees just to get trees back on the island because every tree on the, uh, on the island was killed. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's a sobering chapter here. We're going to, uh, when we come back uh, after our break, we're going to have an interview with, with uh, Kathy Kitchener, who uh, is the poetess there who, who did that. And but before we do that, we are actually going to take a brief break right now. I'm Andrea Gabrielli. I'm the host for Young Talents Making Way here on FinTech Hawaii. We talk every Tuesday at 11 a.m. about things that matter to tech, matter to science, uh, to the people of Hawaii with some extraordinary guests, the students uh, of our schools who are participating in science fair. So Young Talents Making Way every Tuesday at 11 a.m. only on FinTech Hawaii. Mahalo. And you're back here on Pacific Partnerships in Education with me, Ethan Allen, your host here on Think Tech Hawaii, and Paul Haddock, co-host of Pacific Partnerships in Education. And we were just watching uh, Anointed, this very powerful video about the legacy of the nuclear testing. It's, it's truly hard sometimes to understand how, how we could do this, how, how we sort of, how the U.S. got to that stage. Uh, and as you say, it, it, when people on the island now 
resent Marshallese coming and, and, and moving here, which they, of course, have a right to do from the Compact Free Association, it's it's good to be reminded here, right? They've, they've given up a lot for this country. I mean, they, they gave up they, land. They made a dramatic sacrifice, which I don't think was fully explained to them at right. the time. Mm -hmm. They are still dealing with issues of, of high rates of thyroid cancer and other sorts of cancers. Uh, they can never go home. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I, I think we could be a little bit more sympathetic to their plight. Right, yeah. Um, th their rates, yeah, as you point out, some cancers are 10, 20, 40 times the, what the, the general public are. Uh, so they clearly got, uh, many, many of them got heavy doses, uh, and it's uh, caused long-term health impacts. And interestingly enough, the Marshallese are specifically excluded from getting covered by Medicaid, too. Yeah, there's interesting studies on what the rights are of the people that were near Arizona, New Mexico, when tests were done there versus what the rights of the Marshallese mm -hmm. get when it comes to health care or, or payouts for some of the, the court issues that have arisen from the testing that was done. Yeah, so. yeah. And again, and there's that subpopulation of the uh, American soldiers who cleaned up that mess in the 70s and uh, you know, all their issues. But they're again, facing the same right, issues. Right. What they're being told is they're not facing any different rates of cancer than normal 60-year-olds might mm -hmm. face. So they feel like they're, they're being punished for doing things they didn't understand mm -hmm. how serious they were at the time. They were just following orders and obeying and helping yeah. clean up. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a, a, sad, a sad chapter. And let's at this point jump in and uh, bring up the video. We, we talked, we had a chance yesterday to talk with Kathy when she was on Island Here uh, briefly. We were, I was hoping to get her actually on this show, uh, but she had to leave, so we did our next best thing and chatted with her briefly. And if we'll run that video. Well, thanks for sitting down talking with me, uh, Kathy. You, no you and Dan have made a really wonderful video here. Uh, can, can you tell me why, sort of what was the inspiration for this? Uh, yeah, so the poem we created, it's, it's a poem video called An Anointed, and it's all about the Rinna Dome, which is located in Anyway Atoll in the Marshall Islands. Um, so this was mainly actually an educational tool. What we were really hoping to do was raise awareness on the existence of this dome. So it has gotten a lot of features on news clippings lately, like newspapers and you know news agencies have been coming out to, to showcase it. Um, my project was a little bit different in the sense that it was meant to be kind of an artistic project. Um, and so what we did was, uh, I, I, I've done poem videos from a lot of you know, different locations and they're usually very simple, straightforward. This became a lot more elaborate you know, through my partnership with Dan Lin, who is a photographer and also works with us here at Pearl. Um, and so uh, what we, essentially what we're trying to do is raise awareness on the stone. Um, you know, the fact that there is a community living downstream from it just 15 miles and that, you know, it's, it's, it's a catastrophe, really, because it's, it's a huge, you know, huge nuclear waste site. It's, it's, people are saying that it's leaking now, leaking radioactive waste, um, and it's this legacy, this leftover legacy from the nuclear testing um, time period that was conducted by the U.S., yeah. Yeah, I mean, that then sort of, I guess, obviates my, my next question, which is why now? But right, why now, yeah. Because it's... You know, I guess in the context, like, I'm not an international relations expert at all, um, but we have these kind of, you know, looming threats and issues mm -hmm. kind of up in the air right now between um, the United States and, and, and North Korea, and then there was that missile scare here in Hawaii, mm -hmm. and... Um, and then now there's this attack recently that uh, the U.S. has decided to, you know, carry forward. And so there's all these issues of militarization that are, you know, um, that are definitely making this world a lot scarier. And so I guess this is this plays into that conversation, you know, to show this is what happens, you know, to to islands and to people, and this is that, you know, a direct effect of militarization. And so um, I think that I think it definitely brings to light that this is a long-standing issue, that this is not a new issue, that this is an old issue, and that, you know, the people that are affected first are the people who are, you know, more likely to be pushed aside, you know, people of color, people of um, indigenous people, um, people from the land who are easily, f what people, you know, say is forgotten in a sense. So. Right, right. Um, so that brings up the next point. Who do you see as the audience for this? Mm, okay. So as the audience, I guess I see, um, it's in English, so obviously it's an English-speaking audience. Um, uh, but I, I also understand that there's going to be a lot of Marshallese people viewing it, you know, and a lot of a lot of young people viewing it as well. Um, and so I guess it, it's mainly, you know, it's supposed to be meant for the outside, um, for outsiders, because of the fact that it is in English. 
Um, but there's like nuggets in there that I've, I've, you know, I've left for for a Marshallese person that might, you know, be able to understand it a little better. So, um, you know, like that might be able to appreciate it on a different level. So, like um, I talk about, you know, white stones, scattering white stones on graves. So that's a part of a ritual that Marshallese people have called erak, which is what we do at the end of. Um, it's our last funeral rite in a sense. And so I do that. I bring white stones. I collect white stones. I bring these stones in this basket that we usually use to the dome and so it, you know and I like to say that in a sense the creating this video creating the poem and then performing it on the dome became a ritual for me in almost like a healing ritual between me and that island you know between my relationship to that island and so it's it's very personal in a sense right. and I'm not saying that this is how all Marshallese people are going to view it and this is not how all you know Marshallese people might view their relationship to that island but this is just something, uh, something that was very personal to me. The visuals that Dan added for any with a, you know, that elevated the poem to another level. So initially, this poem is meant if you just look at the text, it's a very mournful, sad piece. Right, right. But when you see the visuals of like children jumping into the water, right. you know, or the happy. elders, yeah, it's it's you know, it's also became, you know, in a sense, what I I saw is that through the poem and the through the video aspect, you know, adding that the visuals to the piece made it also like a love poem to the people of Anywedak. Mm -hmm. And that's what I hope, you know, I hope that um, Adami and Anywedak would, would appreciate that on that level, that it would, you know, it's to show that the community is thriving and that they're really beautiful people despite this horrific legacy. Uh, yeah, so is, is that really the message you want to leave people with? I, I guess, sort of a message yeah. Of hope and resiliency? Uh, in a sense, I mean, I think that I want people to be aware of it as an issue. I want people to start thinking of solutions. You know, I'm not yeah, exactly. It's tough, Solutions, right? Yeah. It is. It yeah. is. It's really tough. And I'm not saying that we need to come up with it right now. I mean, I mean, obviously, this is something that would take a team of experts. You know, sure. it would take a team of experts to to talk it through. You know, yeah, people with law, or, yeah. yeah, with law backgrounds and right. scientific. Back I don't have any of that. Right. I'm an artist. Right. So this is next. This is this is not necessarily creating a solution, it's just like, let's talk about this, you know, so, yeah, let's bring this into our conversation. That's, that's how it's going to begin, right? Yeah, so that's all, it's really just a starting piece, in Excellent. a sense, yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. I've, I've really enjoyed talking with you, and thank yeah. you for producing this amazing video. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> So it was great to have the, <clears throat> the chance to talk to Kathy a little bit and get, get her perspective on that. We'd seen initially a, a rough cut that Dan had brought in, and, but it's nice to see the, the final version and, and hear from Kathy a, a little bit about that. So you, you to sort of circle back, you had said early on that <clears throat> Prell has really embarked on a, a, trying to get more of the word out about important regional issues. So what might, what might be next on Prell's uh, agenda then? Well, we, we got a good chance to sit down with Kathy yesterday. Mm -hmm. As you may know, she's working with Prell now. Mm -hmm. uh, that was Dan's first film, too, and it's mm -hmm. beautiful cinematography. Very proud of him. Yes. So we've been thinking of some other stories in the region. We'd like to tell between six and eight stories a year of the region. Mm -hmm. So, for example, many people don't know of the impending ecological disaster in Chuk Lagoon. Mm -hmm. If you study your history, the Japanese Navy, large chunks of it were sunk there during World War II, and those ships are filled with thousands of tons of oil. Those ships are starting to break up. And when they give way and all that oil bubbles to the surface, which has been you know, below the water now for 60 plus years, it will destroy Chuk Lagoon. Uh, they don't know how to solve that problem. The, the Japanese don't need to go in. They, after World War II, they signed a treaty pretty much indemnifying them from, from any of that. The U.S hasn't done anything, Chuk doesn't have the technology or the money to go in. So we see that as, as an issue that, that needs to be explored. Uh, you, you've been doing some work on climate change. You know, islands like in the Marshalls where their highest points are just a few inches above sea level are feeling, you know, and if you get a chance to see Kathy's video that she did, Matafeli Penham in front of the United Nations, a powerful, powerful story how people are, especially during the higher tides, watching the ocean go from one side of the island across to the other. Yeah. What's going to happen to them in the next 10 or 15 years? Even issues surrounding the compact and the freedom with which they can leave as the Federated States of Micronesia and the Marshals are facing some difficulties. Free entry under the compact has made it so easy for young people to leave. This brain drain is impacting the development of those islands. Right. If everybody's moving here or to Guam or to the mainland, who is left behind to solve those issues? Right. So we see a number of things that Prowl can start to do that will give a voice to those regional issues 
that can maybe help bring some attention because we, we need some help. That's why we appreciate groups like, you know, and Pam O'Mitty and her leadership helping to bring this to, to a greater audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. It's why events like Marshall Lee's Education Day, that I have featured a, a young woman who is organizing that. Uh, and she was pointing out that, yeah, they're working very hard to try to keep their young people there, to try to be sure they can have opportunities to get education, but provide incentives to bring them back because they recognize that's that's key to surviving as a country. You can't you can't have your young your young people just leave, right? Yeah, and about one third of all Marshall Lee's and Micronesians have left wow. and are now many of them living here and in the mainland. Mm -hmm. Their children, many of their children, have never seen those home islands. Mm -hmm. So as they assimilate, we're losing a chunk of the world that is very, very rich in culture. Mm -hmm. And the question is, what's that region going to be like 50 years from now? Right, right. Most of those islands are going to be virtually uninhabitable if, this, if sea level rise continues, which shows every sign of doing, right? Uh, and it's, it's not really just the Marshalls, right? There's, I mean, there's a, a there's number islands, of islands. There's yeah. outer islands in Chuk and Yat, which are very low-lying islands. Right. They're facing some of the same issues. As the salt water rises, mm -hmm. it's difficult to grow food. Right. Taro and banana plants are being inundated with salt water. Right. What, what does their future look like? Right. And who is there to help address these issues? Right, and Kiribati, the Maldives, yes. same, same kind of issue. So it, it's not just one or two tiny places. It's a, actually a large number of different cultures and countries across the South Pacific here. And we like to say, we've mentioned this before on the show, we're the canary in the coal mine. Mm -hmm. Sure, these may not be uh, you know, issues that people in the middle of Kansas are facing right now, mm -hmm. but they are going to be impacted sometime in the future. And if we can't help our younger brothers and sisters on these small islands, what kind of people are we then? Yeah, absolutely. This is what partnerships in education are all about, right? Yes, sir. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being here, thank Paul. Thank you, Ethan. Uh, and uh, it was a pleasure watching these things with you and, and talking with you, as always. And uh, until next time, I hope you'll come back and see us again on Pacific Partnerships in Education.